1992, a 65-year-old man by the name of Herbert Weinstein strangled and threw his wife out of his 12-story apartment in New York City. Now, Mr. Weinstein was often described as a loving and outgoing person by his family members and peers. But during his actual testimony in court, he quickly admitted to his guilt and even attempted to cover up the murder so that it would look like a suicide. But here's the thing. Mr. Weinstein has no criminal history whatsoever. And so this raised serious questions about the mental health of Mr. Weinstein, and even to the point where his lawyers that were defending him decided to get an MRI to see what was truly going on inside the mind of Mr. Weinstein, or the mind of a killer. And so these images up here are actual MRI scans of Mr. Weinstein. And what they found is that it seems to be some sort of object that seems to be growing deep within his brain near the frontal lobe. And what this thing that's growing is actually a cyst. And inside the cyst, it's filled with cerebral spinal fluid. And over time, this cyst can begin to swell inside the brain and cause serious neurological damage to the brain and even shut down large parts of the brain. And in order to confirm this finding, the team then ran a PET scan. And what a PET scan does measures how well the brain is functioning in different areas. And indeed, what they found was that the areas in which the cysts were growing were also the areas in which there was low to no brain activity. So now the question in court becomes whether this low activity in Mr. Weinstein's brain truly coincides with the violent behavior we were seeing in him. I mean, I mean, what was happening is they didn't know how to address this issue. And unfortunately, due to a lack of understanding of the brain during this time period, and the fact that PET scan technologies were relatively new, caused the court and jury to believe that there wasn't enough evidence to justify what Mr. Weinstein had done. So as a result, Mr. Weinstein ended up serving years in prison. But let's take a step back. Let's take a hypothetical situation. Let's imagine if the surgical cyst in Mr. Weinstein's brain was to be removed surgically. And, I mean, in theory, Mr. Weinstein would go back to being himself, right? And if that was the case, who exactly would we be punishing in court? I mean, a crime has been committed, but who's the real criminal? And if he was to be excused of this crime, any criminal with any sort of problems in the brain can be excused of their crime. And to further that statement, any person with any sort of problems in their brain can be excused of their responsibility. And that's absolutely nonsense. And that's ridiculous. So the question becomes, where is the line of self-control in the human mind? And these were all questions that were being asked during this case, but were also the very questions that were setting up the foundation for the field of neuroethics. And today, we know that the frontal lobe is indeed, in fact, responsible for many of the cognitive skills that Mr. Weinstein was missing, like emotional expression, problem solving, and even critical thinking. And this makes sense, because we know that the brain develops from the back to the front. And what also helps to explain why teenagers don't always make the best decision. <laughs> but on a serious note, I'm by no means trying to justify the murder of Mrs. Weinstein but rather raise discussion on what's best to be done if this was to occur in another case. And, I mean, imagine if one of your loved ones or family members were all of a sudden to become a different person due to some sort of cyst or tumor that was growing in the brain. I mean, what would you do? And I feel by raising under public understanding of the brain and neuroethics, we'll be better able to treat these, I mean, we'll better be able to make more informed decisions and even treat psychological issues that we once thought were incurable. And we're in such an age where the amount of information we're learning, at the, uh, learning about the brain is exponential. And so much that we don't even understand that the fact that it can even change the norms of our society. Questions that are being asked in neuroethics are like, what are the true limits of stress and how will that change the way business owners treat their employees? Or how does an individual truly learn will revolutionize the field of teaching? Or what is the role of artificial intelligence in our society and how will that shape our future? And these questions are all deep and at the center of discussion in neuroethics, but are only a fraction of the hundreds of thousands of questions that are being asked in this field. And in order to tackle these questions, we have to still learn a little bit more about the brain. 
And one of the ways in which we're doing this is through the Human Connectome Project. And the Human Connectome Project is an effort to map every single neuron in the brain of 1,500 patients from all across the United States and from all different backgrounds. This picture that you see up here is a picture of someone's brain, or more specifically, their neural network. And it's often referred to as the connectome. Now, what scientists are learning about this connectome is that they are unique to an individual, even in twin. So my brain, your brains, or your family member's brain, or your friend's brain, they're all completely different because of different neural networks that's happening. I mean, after all, we're all different in our own way, and so is the beauty of diversity in the human race. But there's some serious problem with this project and some very scary elements that are also coming out of it. Another thing that they learned about these connectomes is that a simple analysis of this connectome can actually lead them to understand what field one would be best at or not. And, I mean, who has access to this kind of information? And the way I see it, there's only two outcomes that can occur. One, we could easily begin to discriminate each other and only allow the people who are the best or naturally gifted to succeed in the workforce. Or we can use it as a way to help each other, learn, learn more about ourselves and improve it. And the other element is the idea that the brain is merely just a series of complex neural patterns. And these complex neural patterns is what makes our personality and makes us who we are who we are. And if we can understand how these neural networks are interacting in the brain through this project, we can, in theory, simulate this into a computer. And then, in theory, you would also be able to create a simulation of you and maybe even learn more about you in the future. And that seems really exciting, but there also comes some serious controversy about this project. But the other idea is that we can use it as a way as artificial intelligence. You know, imagine you being your own artificial intelligence. That is pretty cool, right? And whenever I use the word artificial intelligence, what's the thing that, hap what's the thing that comes up to, in most people's mind is our robots are going to take over our world and take our job and kill us. And these ideas are often exaggerated in movies like The Terminator, Matrix, and even iRobot. And although these t ideas are exaggerated, they aren't completely false either. But one thing we often fail to recognize is that artificial intelligence has actually been around for decades now, and it's not a brand new thing at all. In fact, in 1967, this computer was about the size of a classroom and was designed to play tic-tac-toe. Um, and this is one of the first artificial intelligence we were beginning to see. Fast forward 40 years later, Deep Blue defeated Kasparov, one of the world's best chess players during this time. 2011, IBM Watson defeated these two gentlemen who were considered the world's best Jeopardy players. And Jeopardy is a game that requires more than just logical reasoning and pattern recognition, but one that requires memory retention and applicability, and was generally the first sign of general intelligence. And just last year, Google's DeepMind's AlphaGo defeated the world's best player in the game Go. And the game Go has more possible moves then there are atoms in this universe. And you can see easily that the power of artificial intelligence is progressing very, very fast. But it's also progressing to keep up with the amount of information that we're also learning. In fact, every 18 months, the amount of information that we've learned, discovered, or researched is doubling. So next year, in, eight, next year in August, the amount of information that we've learned, discovered, or researched in that one 18-month period is more than the amount of information than the entire history of the human race. That is a lot of information. That's medical cases doctors have to keep up with, theories that mathematicians and physicists have to learn, and techniques that surgeons have to master. And there's merely just way too much information for one to be doing everything. And the idea is that we can use artificial intelligence to aid us in this process and even increase our knowledge about everything. But will it? I mean, if such information is available in our reach, what is the entire purpose of learning anymore? If any, I mean, any questions that we have now can be searched up in a device that's the size of our hand. I mean, will we as a society begin to value knowledge less and less? 
And if I was to ask any of you this question now, I believe most of you would say, absolutely not. I mean, humans are always curious endeavors and seek to learn more about the world around us. But what if I was to tell you that you're already a victim of this? How many of you have used a GPS or have used one before? Okay, you guys are all victims. <laughs> um, a study just recently came out and it's shown that people who use GPSs, their hippocampus is shrinking. And the hippocampus is the region of the brain that's responsible for sense of direction and long-term memory. And when we're using our GPSs to listen to Siri or some Google Maps app to tell us, turn left, we are not practicing our sense of direction anymore. And indeed, that part of the brain began to shrink. And in a way, we're actually getting dumber. But the whole, pro the whole point of technology and artificial intelligence was to aid us and make us smarter. And this seems to completely counteract what, we, what I just said. But I believe that artificial intelligence has one of the greatest potentials. Put aside all this. I think that it will allow us to learn more about ourselves than ever before. This picture that you see on the left is a picture of the neocortical column. It's a region of the brain that's responsible for thinking, learning, and even dreaming. And the picture that you see on the right is the picture of a neural network that was created by an artificial intelligence after learning a series of tasks. And as you can see, these two, mirror, these two images almost mirror each other, and it's revolutionary. The artificial intelligence will allow us to understand how learning occurs at the neural level, and that will change the way we teach and learn and improve our mind. And this is only one of many potential applications of artificial intelligence, but it's the way we decide as a society how we want to go about this. And neuroethics can see, be seen as a very scary field, questions that are very difficult to answer and face. But I feel like we should be looking at it with excitement and passion because it's a glimpse into a future that I'm looking forward to. Are you? Thank you.